Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we are back with another of our five minute histories. And today we're gonna to talk about cast iron architecture. But before we get there, a number of you have uh, written in and called in saying you're having a hard time hearing uh, these videos, even with the volume turned all the way up. Um, you're not alone. Uh, luckily, a gentleman who's also a member and a listener suggested uh, that we get one of those little lapel microphones um, that you see people wearing on late night TV shows being interviewed. And I have gone ahead and ordered one. Um, it's gonna be here in 10 days. So if I can beg uh, you to please keep the volume up and hang in there, hope is on its way. All right, cast iron architecture. Um, I have to first just uh, have an acknowledgement, say an acknowledgement um, for a book, and I'm holding it right here. It's called Baltimore's Cast Iron Buildings and Architectural Ironwork by Jim Diltz and Catherine Black. And it is a fantastic book. If you are at all interested in uh, cast iron, uh, this is the Bible uh, for Baltimore at least. Um, but before we get to Baltimore's cast iron, let's talk a little bit about what cast iron is and how we got there. Uh, of course, for millennial, millennia, people have been extracting iron from iron ore. Um, and uh, the way they would do it is heat it up, uh, it would get to be kind of soft, and then they would pound it with as heavy and big a thing as you could possibly find and shape it into whatever they were making. Um, and that's called uh, wrought iron. It is wrought by human hands and then later machines. Um, but that's not cast iron. Somewhere in the Middle Ages, our furnaces uh, uh, developed so that they could get the iron ore uh, even hotter. And somewhere along the way, the temperature reached a point where the iron ore, was, the iron was uh, taking in some of the carbon from the charcoal that was being used to heat it up. And that gave it a slightly lower melting point. And in the Middle Ages, all of a sudden, out of the bottom of these furnaces, um, there was liquid iron running out, I think to the surprise of many and maybe uh, considered even an unwanted byproduct. But I bet pretty soon they figured out its value. And in the bottom of these furnaces, they would set up sand molds uh, that would catch this liquid iron. And incidentally, the, little, the molds looked like uh, little piglets suckling, um, thus the term pig iron that many of you may know. And what you could do is when the little piglets cooled, you could break one off. Um, it would weigh maybe 50 or 100 pounds, so maybe not so little, um, but uh, break one off and send it to the village next door where it could be reheated in a, uh, another cast, another mold, uh, maybe in the shape of a fleur-de-lis or a cross, and eventually in the shape of the side of a building in Baltimore, but we'll get there. So we now have cast iron, and in the 1770s, uh, folks in Great Britain, in the northern uh, part of England, uh, were able to develop techniques that, were, that, that, that allowed them uh, to produce a lot of cast iron fairly cheaply. And in fact, they made an entire bridge of cast iron over the Severn River. And that place today is called Iron Bridge. Um, I had the good fortune to be able to go there a few years ago with my family. It's really cool. If you're ever in England, I encourage you to get up there. Um, uh, uh, it is called the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. But nothing much happened for another 60 or 70 years until a gentleman named James Bogardus comes along and he falls in love with uh, cast iron. He's a New York architect and he is convinced, um, he's sort of like an evangelist of cast iron. He tries to convince everybody to use cast iron. Um, and, uh, and eventually he succeeds. In New York in 1848, he builds uh, a row of buildings that have cast iron fronts on them. And then comes along in the late 1840s, I think 1849 or so, a gentleman named A.S. Abel, that great Philadelphia newspaper man. Pause. If you're a Baltimorean and you're saying, that is blasphemy, you just called A.S. Abel a Philadelphia newspaper man, you've probably thrown a shoe at your laptop. Well, he was the great Baltimore newspaper man, but for a brief, tiny one-year stint in the 1830s, his first newspaper was actually in Philadelphia. But uh, by 1838, I believe, he had come to Baltimore and started The Sun, selling it for a penny, um, went on to become a pioneer. He was one of the first, if not the first, to use the railroad and uh, the telegraph, even the Pony Express in gathering news. Um, and he also was a great uh, adapter of new technologies, especially for typesetting and printing. And by the 1840s, folks in New York had invented this uh, uh, machine that could put out 20,000 pages of, uh, of newspaper a day, uh, an, an hour, I'm sorry, an hour. And A.S. Abel wanted one of those. Um, and so he needed to build a new building. And in 1848, he engages Bogardus. He comes down, takes a risk. And Bogardus uh, uh, builds the first all iron building in America. Um, it has an iron front on it, but it also the uh, sort of structural lattice work, the supports on the inside were also made of iron. 
Um, coincidentally, in 18, and it was finished in 1851. Coincidentally, in 1851, back in England, in London, the Great London Exposition was going on, and there was an enormous iron, cast iron building, um, well, essentially a pavilion with glass all around it that caused quite a stir. Here in Baltimore, the, uh, the Sun Building caused an enormous stir, um, and people wanted to replicate it all over the country. Luckily for Baltimore, we had a bunch of ironworks uh, companies already set up, uh, largely accommodating the railroad, making railroad um, uh, uh, ties and railroad rails and railroad cars and railroad bridges. So we were already going with that. Um, and in fact, by the 1830s, we had, I think, something like 35 ironworks. By the 1870s, in Baltimore alone, we had something like 70. So really ramped up. And we were shipping ironwork all over the country, um, from Portland, Maine to Portland, Oregon, um, up to New York, all over. We were a hub of cast iron manufacture. Unfortunately for the Sun Iron Building, although it caused quite a stir, it was not totally uh, fireproof. It was better, but not fireproof. And it uh, did not make it through the 1904 fire. In fact, the 1904 fire took out a lot of Baltimore's cast iron. At one point, we had over 100, maybe 150 cast iron buildings. Um, today, we're from, from the fire, from the uh, building of the convention center, from Charles Center, from the Inner Harbor, we're down to about 15. Um, and the Sun Building is unfortunately not one of them. Um, if you want to take a look at what the Sun Building looked like, however, go up to New York City, to Manhattan, and go to the 200 block of Canal Street. And the building there is uh, remarkably identical what, to what the Sun Building was. Um, I think uh, the report I read uh, said it shared something like 90% of the detailing. Um, all right, so that's it for the Sun Building. I want to do just one more before we close, and that's the William Wilkins Building on Pratt Street, 300 East Pratt. I am sure that most of you have seen this uh, uh, going to the convention center, driving down Pratt, going to a ball game. Um, a really fabulous full-fronted iron uh, uh, building. Um, it was uh, built by a gentleman, William Wilkins, who was a German excuse me, German immigrant who came to Baltimore and started making brushes from boar's hair, from pig's hair, uh, and upholstery from pig and horse hair. Um, uh, he located his office on Frederick Road uh, near where the slaughterhouses were. The animals were brought in by train, uh, slaughtered just outside the city. Um, and if you want to know where the term pig town comes from, that's a whole other story, but, uh, but that's that same system. So uh, Wilkins eventually employs 700 people. He has a national distribution for his brushes, um, and he builds his new headquarters at 300 West Pratt Street. Um, and it's a fabulous ironworks building. Um, two interesting things. Um, first, the top floor, the windows are actually a little smaller than, uh, than they are on the other floors. And uh, in a weird way of optical illusions, it gives it the illusion when standing on the street that they're actually taller, but they're not. The other interesting thing is that the first telephone message uh, transmitted in Baltimore went from that building to uh, Wilkins's uh, uh, operations out by the slaughterhouses in, on Frederick Road. The first telegraph came to Baltimore and the words were, what were they, what hath God wrought? Probably the first telephone words were something like, how is the brush order to Philadelphia going? Um, so uh, that building was uh, fantastic. Uh, was occupied until the 1970s uh, when the city bought it and then it went vacant. Uh, but in the 1980s, uh, a bunch of advocates uh, convinced the city to sell the building to a private developer who did a fabulous job restoring it. In fact, it was one of the first two or three buildings, uh, cast iron buildings in the country to be restored. So we had the first full cast iron building in the Sun building and we had the first one to be restored in the William Wilkins building. Um, and I think I will end on this note that uh, the restoration uh, included wonderful uh, work by a company out of Salt Lake City that specializes in cast iron. They redid the bolts and the, all of the joints and everything. Um, and they also, the developer added an addition. You can see the addition on the sides. Um, I will leave it up to you to, to say whether that is architecturally successful, um, but I will go out on a limb and say, I think it's really elegant and it works well. So we did not get through all of cast iron today. I think we might try to come back to it tomorrow and we'll see you then.